Hey there, it's Sean McGeever. I hope you are having an awesome day. I'm doing a Talk Tuesday. I know it's Friday, but the week just got away from me, got the best of me. Uh, so it's Friday, Friday night actually. I'm about to head out to uh, Wildlife Club, actually two Wildlife Clubs to try to lend a hand. So, um, But I've been working hard and preparing. I've been loving looking into Luke 7. So I'm just going to go ahead and jump in. Actually, I had, to, I had a phone call. <laughs> um, it was my wildlife club. I better do this quick. Uh, Luke 7 includes four stories, uh, three of which could easily fit into a good club talk. Um, there is the uh, story of Jesus heals a centurion, a story of Jesus raises a widow's son. There's a story of Jesus' answer to John the Baptist, and there's a story of Jesus forgiving a sinful woman. And while the three on their own, um, other than the one with John the Baptist, uh, all of them could be excellent club stories, uh, club talk stories. I think Luke is doing something in this chapter that I would really want to highlight. Um, and it would actually be easy to miss if you just kind of look at them uh, as an isolated story. But I just encourage you to um, not do that, but to look at uh, big, big chunks of scripture, the entire chapter, maybe a chapter or two. Because what you see here is in the first story and in the last story, there's a connection. And I think that that's what I would do in my club talk. I want to make that and the, uh, connection. And the connection is this, that in the first story, you have the centurion. The centurion was a really well-known, powerful um, uh, person and that person would have had lots of power. I'm going to draw a contrast in a second. Um, and at the end you have the woman who's sinful and, um, is just kind of at the, at the bottom. So you have someone who's at the top and you have someone who's at the bottom and both of them, uh, have an experience with Jesus where they uh, show their faith and, uh, and Jesus responds. So I think that this is just a great opportunity to talk about our invitation in young life and, and Jesus's invitation uh, to every single person, every kid, whether you're uh, kind of a catch-all. So whether you are rich or poor, if you're popular, outcast, religious, not religious, you are welcome here and God wants to work in your life. So, you know, just a couple uh, details uh, between the centurion and the simple woman. Uh, the centurion and the simple woman, obviously there's a man one's a, and the other's a woman. Uh, one is a Gentile, the centurion's a Gentile. Uh, most likely the woman is uh, Jewish. Um, the centurion, because he's powerful, could send people to say, have, have Jesus come to me. Uh, the simple woman actually uh, can't do that. She has no power or influence. Uh, she has to go to where Jesus is at. Um, in uh, verse four, the centurion, the people call him worthy. So he's a really worthy and respected person. Um, on the other hand, the woman is obviously sinful, called sinful. So we have a worthy person, uh, someone who's known as worthy, someone who's known as sinful. Um, he's known uh, for his love for the nation and that he had built uh, the Jewish people a synagogue, uh, which is quite amazing as a Gentile person uh, to do that. Um, and then all she really had going for her was that she had her love for Jesus. So she didn't have a lot of influence except for what she could do. But here's where the stories kind of come together. Even though they're on two ends of the spectrum, they come together in this, that they both know that they're not worthy of Jesus. Um, and they both show that they have faith. You see that in verse seven, I'm sorry, in verse nine and in verse 50. Um, and then what they both see is a powerful work, a powerful work of healing in verse 10 and a powerful work of forgiveness in verse 48 and 50. And so um, what you see is two totally different people who have an experience of Jesus and it comes together because of faith and because of God's power. I have a little chart there if, if you look up the sheet and you can see the details there. Um, but one thing I do want to point out is that um, a very important key uh, hermeneutical or exegetical key, which is just a fancy word for how you do Bible study to look for main points and such, is to look at the end of the passage. So if you, if you look at the end of the passage, what you'll see at the very end of this chapter is in verse 49, it says, then those who were at the table with Jesus said to themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And so um, while the emphasis certainly might be with, you know, all the different things that Jesus did, whether healing the servant, um, the centurion servant, or, or the things that he, um, you know, kind of looked out for, for the woman, um, who is this that, uh, who even forgives sins? It kind of reminds me um, that in, when we tell the story of the wind and the waves, when Jesus calms the storm, uh, the question in the boat when they get back isn't, um, what storm are you going through? The question is, who is this man that even the wind and the waves obey him? So here we have something very sim similar. They're going, wait, after they see all this, they go, who is this who even forgives sins? 
And so the emphasis isn't on um, what can now God do for me. Uh, God isn't a vending machine. Uh, we don't tell God what to do. Um, the idea would be to be in awe of the person of Jesus um, and to try to uh, aim to paint a picture where we respond like the woman with tears and thankfulness and worship. Um, so make it letting God be God and letting us just be the people who respond to him. So um, I'll just move on to a couple main points and roll through it here. But one main point is to talk about how uh, the difference between temporary need and eternal need. So temporary need is always wanted and needed appreciate it, but eternally, eternal need is absolutely needed. Um, we should ask ourselves, um, like those uh, who are with Jesus, um, who is this that even forgives sins? Another thing uh, that we could ask is that, um, or we could make as our main point, is that Jesus wants to show everyone from all ends of the spectrum uh, that Jesus is God and that he uh, works in the lives of anyone who comes to him. It doesn't matter where you're coming from. Uh, he wants to work in your life. And then the last one, maybe main point would be, um, what qualifies us to connect with God? Um, it's our need. Need is the thing that uh, necess uh, necessitates faith in Jesus. If you don't need God, if you don't need help, you don't need Jesus. <laughs> if you need help, <laughs> you uh, will be found uh, by Jesus when you turn to him. So what does this show us a little bit about Jesus? Well, in verse 10, we clearly see that Jesus has the power to heal. And in verse 50, we see that Jesus has the power to forgive sins. Jesus is no mere man. He's not our homeboy. Um, Jesus is God. Uh, another thing is that Jesus doesn't look at outward appearances. He looks at faith. He looks for faith. What does this have to do with our life? Well, we can experience God's power in our lives when we put our trust in Jesus, plain and simple. I'm going to give you a couple technical details and then uh, possible illustrations, and then I'll wrap it up. Um, four technical details. First is that it talks about being a centurion, that this man was a centurion. So it talks about that in verse two. Um, as the, the word might imply, this was a Roman soldier who was over a hundred people sent, um, a hundred, uh, centurion. So he's over a hundred, uh, soldiers. Um, there were other kinds of, uh, officers. There's, uh, uh, decorian. So over 10, and then there's, uh, someone who's over a thousand, a, a chilla arc is what they're called. Um, but centurions were rich. And from the resources that we know from the first century, they're actually paid 50 to 100 times what their soldiers were paid. So just kind of do the math, maybe kind of a standard pay times 50 or 100. That's a lot of money. It's rich and it shouldn't surprise us why he was able to build a synagogue for the people he was serving um, in his town. So that's a centurion. Another thing is it talks about the woman being able to go into the house. And this is just a bizarre cultural thing. But, but when there was someone who was significant in the community and went in to have a conversation and eat a meal, it was kind of like a public event. The door would have been open and vid visitors would have been allowed. So that she's there, or maybe that even other people were there, isn't an odd thing. Um, it would have been odd because she was looked down upon so much. Uh, they would have been surprised why, why she was in there. But just that anyone was in there wasn't uh, culturally a problem. Two more things. The sinful woman. Uh, it's not certain because it doesn't say it explicitly, but almost um, almost certain we know that this woman would have been a prostitute. And there's a couple of reasons why. I won't go into all the details, but um, we can assume that this woman was uh, most likely uh, a prostitute. Um, there's evidence that uh, whenever a woman would let her hair down, if her hair wasn't put up, uh, that she was immoral, that it was improper. It uh, didn't matter if you're a Jewish or a Gentile, you just didn't do that. And so that this woman had her, her hair down and that she was washing Jesus's feet with her hair, um, it would have just shown that she was a really improper woman. Even if it was an act of worship, it was improper. Um, just a little bit after the time of Jesus there, there was evidence that if a woman did that, that um, let her hair down, that would have been instant grounds for divorce and um, just was would have been uh, terrible and, and unacceptable in their society. So that's just a cultural thing. Um, uh, another uh, detail, actually I have five, is about the ointment. It talks about how she had perfume. It would have been common. Um, Jewish women in those days almost always wore a necklace, a flask around their um, uh, neck, and it would have had some ointment in there. Um, and in this case, so it would, it's not uncommon that she had some. Uh, the part that's unique is that she had expensive perfume. Uh, women may, probably would have uh, carried uh, more commonly like olive oil, which was cheap and plentiful. She had an expensive perfume um, and was willing to pour it out at Jesus' feet. The last uh, part, the fifth part, uh, is about that she was weeping and kissing Jesus' feet. 
um, and this was just acts of devotion. The weeping that's described there was an intense weeping. This wasn't just like one little tear or a little sniffle. Um, this was just absolutely just wrecked, kind of uh, tears falling down. In fact, the word and the idea there behind it is like uh, tears, like rain showers just coming down. So just the amount of emotion and intensity where she just realizes that she's at the feet of the living God. Um, it, this is a very emotional moment for her. And also the, the word for kissing there that Luke uses here in chapter seven um, is the same word that we find in Luke 15 when the prodigal father sees the prodigal son and goes up and kisses his son. It's the same word, um, but actually dialed up more. So it's a very intense, meaningful kind of a kiss at Jesus's feet um, that shows her intense devotion and deep reverence for Jesus. I have two possible illustrations and then I'm done and then I got to head off to, to wildlife, um, which is uh, I had an idea of, of kind of like medicine and then a clock. And uh, the idea would be to show a contrast be uh, between something that kind of helps temporarily, like some, you know, some medicine, maybe a prescription or something like that. We all need it. Super helpful. We all need healing. Uh, we want to feel better. We want to get better. That's okay to ask for, but all healing is temporary. When on the other hand, um, I thought you could bring in a clock, maybe like one of those big clocks that they have um, in a school or something. And if, especially if you maybe just go to um, you know Walmart or something, I don't think they're very expensive. Ones that have a really big second hand that goes and makes that loud clicking noise. I don't really have one here, but I have one that's a little bit uh, small. But show that second hand and just let it ring out and you go tick, tick, tick. You say there's a difference between something that helps temporarily and something that helps forever. And while um, the centurion uh, servant was healed, the woman received forgiveness and that lasts forever. So maybe just drawing the importance of not only seeking God, maybe it's help in uh, things that are temporary, that's uh, okay, but also seeking um, God's forgiveness and an eternal help. The last idea is uh, the idea of just uh, God's welcome to everyone, no matter where you're at. And I had an idea, I don't have one on me, but a neon sign just says, welcome, welcome. Maybe you can borrow one from a store or uh, buy one. I don't know. I think I see them at Costco sometimes. Um, maybe you could return it. I don't know. Um, but, uh, or just put it up on a, like on the screen. If you have a, a projector, just like one of those flashing welcome and just kind of make the point that everyone is welcome and that everyone uh, can respond to God. So anyway, I hope some of that's helpful and I uh, hope you have some good club talks. I'm going to hear two of them or at least one or two of them tonight. So all right, talk to you later. Bye.